you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to continue our series that we've been preaching out of the out of the Luke, and, and today we're going to move to the Gospel of Luke. Last week we've been preaching uh, out of uh, a couple messages out of the, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, today we're going to be moving. We've been preaching this series over the harvest and about the harvest, so we want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to stay with us. If you didn't bring your Bibles, I'm sure it's because you have it memorized. But if you don't have it memorized, we're going to use the screen up here. You can follow along with us and, and we'll be sharing in the Word of God a little bit this morning. This morning's message, uh, and, and again, I've been preaching out of this section of Scripture, out of the Gospel of, of Luke. But also today, uh, when we look at this particular section of Scripture, it is out of Matthew that this, this was written. And then Luke writes the same thing in the same process, writes it down and shares with us this same passage of scripture many places in the throughout the gospels they are redundant about certain scriptures and this is one of the things that you'll see in the gospel of matthew and also in luke and and as we read this it's because it's the conversation of jesus with his disciples but this particular setting is a little bit different the scripture uh, it may be the same and it may may witness to being the same but the the area and the place to where it's going on and what's happening around it is what i want to concentrate on this morning because i'm not, my message is very simple this morning it's a simple passage a simple message of scripture out of the gospel of, of luke if you will it's just called sent s-e-n-t sent and i was going to say um uh you know go or just get out and go and I was afraid that somebody might take me literally and leave, and I didn't want to do that, so sent is the title of my message today. So if you'll take just a few minutes, you, if on the back of your bulletin you can write down some notes, and if you, if you have any questions, be sure and ask me. But I, I'm, this morning, I want, to, I want to talk this morning about that God has already commanded you. You don't have to wait for anything else. You just have to be ready to do what He's asked you to do. Amen? This morning, if you'll bear with me just a few minutes... The Gospel of Luke, starting with verse 1 of the chapter, 10th chapter of Gospel of Luke, it says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and a place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Would you just bow your heads for, the, for just a few minutes? And I pray that God would anoint you to hear and you would anoint me, God, that I would be able to share your word in such a way. I pray that you would touch these lips of clay, that I would deliver the message that you've put upon my heart. And I pray that every ear would be open, that they would receive. And I pray for a special anointing. God, that you would break through the works of the enemy that try to interfere and block your work. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would set us forth to commission us to do your work. God will glorify you in that that you do today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Again, stay with me in the, in the scripture today because we're going to share about it. Now, I know that this proximity, we shared that scripture, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. That was the theme that we've been preaching from. We talked about the size of the harvest. We talked about what's going on in our society and how that the world is being literally shaken apart. That circumstances are all around us, pushing us and driving us to the place. But God is, this is not an accident. This is not, this is on purpose. God is using these events that are happening in the world today so that we will have a purpose and an opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with those in need. And when we look at the opportunity that's placed before us, we must be ready to serve when He opens the opportunity. When we see things around us, when we have opportunities, God is preparing us to set us forth so that we can share what God is capable and able and desiring to do in this confused world. When we look at that, we begin to see the harvest is truly great. There has never been a greater opportunity to share Jesus Christ with those around us. And some of us today, we're saying that I'm, I'm waiting for this or I'm waiting for this opportunity. I'm waiting for circumstances to change. And I told you last week, we need to get busy because we don't know when the next opportunity will come. Our path may never cross that way again. 
We may never see our loved ones and have that opportunity. It's the urgency of the hour to share the work of God and share what God can do. One of the things that Jesus goes ahead and does and after that third verse, after he begins to share about that and sending these 70 out, he begins to explain to them the work that they're about to do. And he begins to share them that you don't have to worry about what you're about to do. How many of you right now, if I was to say, we're going to go out and go door to door, how many of you would have an excuse why you couldn't go? Don't, don't raise your hands. Because that's the firing squad lineup. That's what... We all would all have an excuse. It's too hot. It's too cold. Uh, come on. I mean, it, it, it's, it's cold out here for us Arizonans. Amen. It's dropped below 100. So we, we, we'd all have excuses. I, I'm, I'm too busy. I, I'm afraid. Somebody doesn't like me. I, I, I don't want to knock on a door because they might shoot me. Uh, I don't want to. Be... And we have all got our fears and excuses. But Jesus took the 70 and he began to go through it. And he said, these are the reasons why you don't have to be afraid. These are the reasons why you don't have to fear. Look at what he says here. The first thing he tells them in verse 4, he says, uh, you don't have to worry about money. Come on, how many of you would say, I, I, would do, I would do evangelism work, but I am concerned about the money. I, I just, I, I can't afford to do it. The Bible says right here, he says, carry neither money, a, a bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet one another along the road. Uh, here, here's one of the things that you've got to understand. If money is your reason for not doing God's work, God takes care of that. You don't need money when you trust God. The Bible says he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Some of the effort that we need to do is step out in faith and just go. Amen? We don't have to wait until somebody says, well, we're waiting. We're, we're hoping to get in it. And every time we do our finances on our building program, we, we keep thinking about, well, I got to. Uh, we, we, now we're to a million and a half, and then the last estimate, they said, well, it's going to be higher than that, and we can just build a portion of uh, three million, and it's going, ha, last estimate was, Chuck, how much are we up to now? I don't, when, when we look at how much it's going to cost us to build, we keep making excuses why we can't, let me share this with you. We have been blessed with this building. If we have to fill it two or three times, let's do it. Why would God give us a building to seat 500 if we can't fill one with 150? We don't have any excuses for money. That's, that's not a problem for God. My God has all the riches and glory. If we need it, God could send us somebody to write a check for $5 million. Go ahead and write that today, will you? I'm not just going to say, but... But when God's ready, when we're ready, He will send that. We don't have to do it. We don't have to worry about it. Look at the next statement that he says. Go ahead. He says, uh, share the peace of God. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever house you enter, uh, he says, first say peace to this house. And if a uh, son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. If I go door to door, they're going to slam the door in my face. Probably they will. I've knocked on doors. I've had them chase me off their yard. I had one guy sick a dog on me. I've had him spit at me. I've had him slam the door. But I've also had him cry and break down in their front yard saying thank you for caring. I never will forget one time I was over across the street at the, at the trailer park right across the street over here. And I was, we went door to door. We were evangelizing over there and passing out flyers about the church. And I mean, I, I, I never will forget. I, I walked up to this gentleman. He was sitting there in the front yard. And, he had been drinking. You could smell the alcohol as I approached him. And he had a can sitting there with a cooler. And I walked up to him and he goes, hey, man, how you doing? I said, hi, I'm, I'm from Life Church right across the street. Just wanted to say we're out knocking on doors. And he looked at me. He goes, hey, man, sit down and have a beer. <laughs> of course, me, you know, anybody who knows me, I said, no, nah, I've had enough today. <laughs> I sat down in a lawn chair beside him. We started talking. And I never will forget. He started sharing with me. You, you know, see, if you get, if they're drunk, they'll generally open up. Yeah, you've broken through right there. But he started telling me all about the problems that he was going through. And before I left, I said, hey, can I, can I pray with you? I said, I'd just like to pray with you and tell you God loves you and God cares about you. When I started praying with him, Mark, you know, you could, you could, I could feel his eyes looking at me, you know. I could feel that. Uh, and so I kind of opened up one eye being super spiritual. I kept one closed. 
And he was looking at me, and as I prayed, the Holy Spirit began to feed me with things to say. God's going to restore your marriage. God's going to restore your home. That that Satan has tried to destroy and steal from you. And I'm going to tell you something. When I, when I finally said amen, I looked up, and the tears were flowing out of this guy's eyes. And he said, Pastor, who told you all those things about me? And I said, God did. You don't have to be afraid of the combatants and the work of the enemy. You have peace, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Enter the workforce for God and begin to say, peace goes before me, peace surround me as I go. Listen, th th not everybody's going to embrace you and say, I'm so glad you came to see me. Some of them don't want anything to do with it. Leave your flyer, shake their hand, tell them God loves them and you love them. And then walk away if that's what they want to do. Because I'm going to tell you something, God gives you the peace that they need. Share it with them. Go ahead and pull the next one up, Johnny. It says, we, be hospitable. This, we have to work on some. But, uh, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as, as given, uh, for the laborers are worthy of his wage. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter, they receive you. Such, eat such things as are set before you. I'm going to tell you, we, we live in a world in, in today that we are, the, we are picky people. Amen? Just like when I sat down with that gentleman over there in the lawn chair. And he said, do you want a beer? No, no, no. I've had all I need. You know, I, I, I can tell you this. Everybody that knows me knows that I hate sauerkraut. I do not like my mom amen that. Can you hear that? But I don't like sauerkraut I can't stand the smell of it and I'm going to tell you something if I sat down at somebody's table I would say I am already full <laughs> you go ahead and eat that sauerkraut you can have all of it you want but I am full and I would drink all the water I could to keep that smell away from me but I don't have to be rude about it I don't have to get sick about it I don't have to ignore them because they're different than me when I come into somebody's home and I begin to minister to them I respect who they are. I respect what they are and where they are. They're not all on the same spiritual level. Some of them are sitting in a lawn chair needing to hear that Jesus loves them, drinking the beer, trying to, to soothe their tears away. And some of them are, are drugs and, and alcohol. Some of them are, are prostitutes. Some of them are living in, 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 just to survive. And, and the world needs to know that you love them. And when you come into their home and come into their presence, you're not there to point your finger and tell them how bad they are or what's wrong with their life. They need to know that God loves them and you love them. And when you walk into their presence, you need to let them know, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here just to share and tell you that I love you. That's truly going to the ministry to reach the harvest. Amen. I want to just go ahead and pull that last one up, Johnny. Know that he will provide for you. God always will provide. Go ahead and pull that scripture up. And pray for the sick. That We are to pray for those. Who, and, and every time that I go to, to knock on a door, every time that I visit with someone, I always ask them, if, I, if I'm at your home, I will visit with you. And if I go to your home, if I'm ever invited, I'm trying to make eye contact with some of you. Just don't serve sauerkraut. I'll come see you anytime you want. Joe, don't you do it. No. I wouldn't even, uh, even eat the hot dog that's touched the sauerkraut. Ugh. But the last thing that I do before I leave anybody's home is I say, can I pray with you? Is there anything you need to pray about? Anything I can pray with you for? And anything that, that I, and, and I always try to pray with them. Because I, I can't always understand what they need, but he does. Right. And he always knows what they need to hear. Let me go on. The, the last thing that, that it says here is be prepared to share the gospel. Here's where we miss it so often. And here's where we miss it when God calls us in and he tells us to go and he tells us to prepare. And he was telling the 70, listen, what they're to share. You don't need to tell them everything about, all, you don't, believe it or not, you don't have to have this book memorized to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. You just need to share the love of Jesus Christ and you need to share what he did in your life and you need to share who he is 
and listen to their story so they can relate to what God is doing. When you begin to do that, you will see the love of God and you will see the ministry and the work of God. You see, God simply wants us to go. That's what he's called us to do is go. He takes care of every excuse that the disciples begin to make and what they were thinking of. He begins to share with them. Listen, I can give you the Roman road to heaven. I can tell you how to take a few scriptures and teach someone how that God loves them. But the best thing that you can relate to them is I remember when God found me. When I was lost, he saved me. Sometimes, and most of the time, I find that God uses someone that I meet that's going through something that I can relate to. Because he'll bring me in contact with those who I can minister to because I'm going, I've been there and done that. What? I can go to someone. I, I, I've shared with you about the loss of my sister. And a lot of times when I'm at someone's house, I, I can share with them that are grieving because God loves them. And I knew that God, I found out that God loved me even in the midst of a difficult situation. And sometimes you just got to share what, how many of you know what God did for you? You remember where he saved you when you were lost? Do you remember how he brought you out of the, of the sin and the, and, the, and the circumstances that were surrounding you? How many of you remember where he found you? And how many of you remember what he changed you and how he did that for you? That's simply the message that they need to hear. And if we begin to share that message, we'll see the world and we'll see success in what God sent us to do. Go ahead and pull that next one up. Just go. I was sitting in behind a car the other day. Try to be nice. It may have been one of you, I'm just saying. But I was sitting behind a car, the light changed, traffic goes in the other lane, and I'm sitting there, as patient as I can be. And I said to myself, just go! It doesn't get any greener, just go! Mark, I sat there through almost the whole green light. I was thinking, man, all of a sudden, the person looks up and goes, oh, accelerated through it, and I started to go, and then the light turned yellow, and I just sat there again. <laughs> just go. You know what we do? Here's what we do. God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. God, you supply my needs. I will do for you. I will commit to you, and I will serve you. And God gives you the green light to go and we'll say, I'm just going to say, think about how green that light is. And God's saying, just go. Just go. You, I've commanded you. I've told you. I've issued you. I, I, I've sent you out. Just go. Go ahead and pull that next one up. He says, therefore... Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. One of the things that we oftentimes pray about in our church is revival. One of the greatest revivals that I've ever seen in my life happened because people got serious about praying for souls. When's the last time you just took time to pray for the people around you? Just praying for them. Listen, I, I can tell you this. When Jesus was telling his disciples, pray for the Lord of the harvest that he would send out. He wasn't saying you're isolated and you don't need to go. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, as you go, let them be encouraged to go with you. Come on, amen. amen. Sometimes we sit there and what we'll do is say, go get him, pastor. He's a go-getter. I got your back, pastor. About four yards back, I'm there. You know what? It would be great if each of us, every, listen, if you bring somebody with you, here's what you need to do. Bring them to church with you and then... Introduce them to everybody you know in this church. Amen? Amen. Dave? They might, they might come back. They, they, if they met some of us, they might not. <laughs> but you need to meet them and take them and just let them meet somebody and say, hey, we're just real people. We're just like you. We might, be, we might have different hairdos. <laughs> we might come from different places. We might all look alike. Aren't you glad of that? But, but here's what we got to do. We got to realize that when we do what God has called us to do and, we, and he sends us out, we can't worry about that. We do, we're, we're all together in this thing. Amen? Amen? 
And when we do that, we begin to reach a community that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what color skin they've got. It doesn't matter what language they speak. Come on. When we, when we send them out two by twos and I try to, to do what the gospel says, send them out two by twos, we would at least have one person that could speak Spanish when we go to the houses around our community. Because I can tell you, most of them, if not all of them, need a translator. And so we would go, and I, I, I would go and, and we would pass out the flyer and a lot of times we, we print the, the information that we have on our, our, our calendars or whatever we do. We try to do it in both English and Spanish because that way you can give it to them. Amen? You see, because our, our God has sent us to a harvest field and they're not always going to be the same as we are. They're not all where we are and they're not all the same as we are. And if they speak Spanish... Encourage them. I, I have taken a back seat to many people because I don't speak the language. Amen? Amen? Here's what they say. You say it, I'll say it too. And I'll say, God loves you. God wants to touch you. God wants to change your life. Here's what you've got to realize. And I begin to go through the steps to how to receive Jesus Christ. I begin to share the, the passages of how that God loved them and God will forgive them. And they speak it in, the, in, in Spanish. Just like Laura's back there translating today. Because I can't speak Spanish. Can I, Brother Padilla? I don't do Spanish very well, do I? <laughs> Laura says, you can't even speak English very well, Pastor. But here's the best thing that we can do. Is equip ourselves to the best capable ability. And then depend on God. Depend on him. To, to, to where I can't, he can. I do what I do and I step out in faith and God will supply the need that we have. Go ahead and pull that next one up. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even into the end. Go ahead and pull that next one up. He said in Mark, the, the 16th chapter, uh, verses 15 and 16, he said, And go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Luke, the, six, the 24th chapter, verses 46 to 49, says this, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise, to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses to these things. Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. You see, a lot of us Pentecostals, we have missed that part. We are tarrying until we're endued with power and then we continue to tarry. The power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of Pentecost was not so we could say, look what we've got. It's so we could be equipped to go. It's not just about speaking in tongues. It's about the initial evidence so that we can be fortified to reach a lost and dying world. It is the assurance that the power of God flows in you. It is the work that God has called us all to do. When I look at this, these passages in Scripture, there's something familiar. Every one of them are talking about going somewhere, doing something, not waiting for people to show up. I've, I've pastored churches and I've been in churches and I can tell you this. One of the things that I will, I will tell at every church that I pastor is this. It is not about waiting for people to come in. It's about us going to where they are and bringing them in. The Bible says, go and compel them. Go, go, go. Over and over, he tells us to go. Over and over, he tells us that we are to go, to reach, to do. If it was to sit here and, and occupy until he comes. When we look at this, we are realizing that God is searching for those who are willing to go. We are searching and God is searching and seeking out those that will go. I want you to look at Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, one of my... My favorite passage in Scripture is Isaiah, the sixth chapter. He says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train, uh, the train of his robe, filled the temple. 
Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And two he covered his face. And two he covered his feet. And two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then, then one of the seraphims flew to me, having his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Now, I said all that and I wanted to read all that because before you go out and start witnessing for Christ, you need to get rid of some things in your life. Amen? I'm not saying you've got to be perfect and that will be an excuse that you might try to use. But I can tell you this, if you are openly living in sin, it will be hard for you to witness for Jesus Christ. Because you're going to send some confused, mixed messages. You know why so many of us have a hard time reaching our family? It's because they know how we are. They know the way we are. They've seen us at our worst. And they struggle with it. They struggle with the identity of who we are. And sometimes that's a hard hurdle. But when God touches you and transforms your life, you are ready and prepared. When that coal from the altars touches your lips, you are removed. He says right there, he says that your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Your sin is forgiven. I'm just telling you this. Sometimes we need to just, before we go anywhere or do anything for God, we need to get down on our knees and say, God, if there's anything in me that would negatively reflect, God, forgive me of it. We, we need to cry out like David cried out in the, in the 51st Psalm and say, Father, touch my lips. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away, but, but restore to me the joy of my salvation. Amen? Yeah. It's not because you have to be perfect. You simply have to be willing to let God touch you and transform you. Yeah. And once you are transformed, here's, here's, I like this in verse 8. God searches for who to sin. Here's what it says in verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said... Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Because he knew that he had already been on an altar. He already knew that he had, he had been used. And he already wanted to be used. And, and if God is sitting there in the Old Testament and he looks to Isaiah and says, Who will go for us? God is still asking that question. Who will go for us? I'm not saying you have to go through the ministerial training program. I'm not saying you have to do all of the, the stuff that you, you don't have to have a degree or you don't have to have all the credentials to do it. You know what you just do? Share the love of Christ that you've experienced in your life. Amen. The transformation of what has happened in you. And God will begin to bring forth the work that he wants to in you. He will present to you opportunities and places to witness for him. As we go, we'll see the work of God. Notice what it says here. Go ahead and pull that next one up. In verse 9 it says, And he said, Go and, and tell this people, Keep on hearing and do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. He was sharing with them. He said, Keep on doing it. Keep on going. Keep on telling them. They may not get it right now, but they will. Keep on. Here's what some of us do. Well, I tried. They didn't like it, so I, I quit. They were mean and I quit. They weren't, they didn't hug me the way that they should. They slammed the door in my face. I've told you about the, the John Alert, and I think I, some of you remember the story about the man that, the pastor had already been to this man's house. He'd been there a couple times. 
No response. He never even answered the door. But he, we knew he was there. The pastor said, the family said, he, he's been going through some depression. You need to go and visit with him again. I was on my way home. I said, oh, no. Now I was kind of complaining to God. Anybody ever done that before? I don't have time. I've got all this other stuff to do. I, I don't know. And I can tell you this. Here's what happened. I went to John's house on my way home. Usually I'd always take somebody with me, but I was on my way home, so I just said, I'll go by. I knocked on John's door. I didn't hear anything, but I could hear some noise. So I knocked again. When I knocked the third time, I heard the bed squeak, and I thought, well, I know somebody's in there. About that time, the door opened. A man stood before me with tears running down his face. He encouraged me to come into his house. He said, come on in, sit down. I thought, oh, well, at least I've got in the door. When he asked me to sit down, here's what happened, Don. He asked me to sit down on a, between us was his pistol. He said, before you knocked on that door, I had a gun to my chin. I was getting ready to kill myself. I began to talk to him about the love of God and how God loved him. We prayed about some mistakes that he had made and some bad decisions that he had done. And I prayed for him. And as we prayed, the love of God began to fill his heart. And, and I told him, I said, listen, I, I'm going to call you and I want to I wanna check on you. Are you okay? I loved it. We hugged each other. We hugged it out. I didn't, I, 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 we left and I, I called him the, the Saturday before service on Sunday. I'll see you at church on Sunday. When we showed up at church... Because I had quoted a scripture to him. Whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. John had a t-shirt business, and I didn't know this. And he showed up with a t-shirt that said, a big smiley face on it, and it said, I'm a whosoever. And he came walking in, and he hugged my neck, and he said, thank you that you kept knocking. Thank you that you came. And thank you because you didn't quit. Oh, I, I didn't want to tell him. Oh, I wanted to. I didn't want to go by. I wanted to go home. But that little deviation, about 35, 40 minutes, changed the life. Come on, amen? Sometimes you just got to go. Sometimes you just have to go. God sent us to go. He sent us to make a difference. Go ahead and pull that next scripture. The Bible says, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I don't know where God's going to send you. It may be in your backyard. It may be in your neighborhood. It may be at your work or your school. It may be where you go on a regular basis. Or it may be that God has a plan to send you around the world. Wherever he sends you, you are his minister. You are his witness. He sends you when you're willing to go. When you're willing to go. Go ahead and pull that last one up. The gospel was never something to just hold on to, but it is something to share. So, some, when I was writing that down in my office, the Lord told me to tell somebody in this place, you need to hear that and you need to receive that. You've received the gospel and all you've done is hold on to it. You need to take that gospel and share that gospel. Go ahead and pull the last one up. If you are waiting for an invitation to go, you have it. If you are waiting for the right time, it is now. If you want to know how, just tell them about him. I believe that God would have each of us to go, to do, to share the message of Jesus Christ. The harvest is truly great. The laborers, they are few. There's just not enough of us. It won't always be where a crowd will show up. Sometimes it's a one-on-one -on -one in a break room. Somebody starts telling you about the problems. You have that opportunity to share who Jesus Christ is. It may be a family member that's going through a disaster you have a chance to share the love of Jesus Christ. It's up to you. Today, we have an opportunity to make a difference. We have an opportunity to make a difference. There's no doubt 
There's no greater time. There's no greater time. There's no greater time. It is now. What if I'd have said, I don't have time, and I just told the pastor, I don't care, I'm going home. What if I would have said, I'm too busy to mess with this right now. When God sends us an opportunity, take advantage of it. Make the best of it and tell them God loves them. I want us to stand right now all across this place. There are three things that I want to do in this altar call. As I was praying about this message, oftentimes when I pray, I've shared this with young ministers, the most important part of the message is to ask God, what do you want me to say when I close? What do you want me to say when I finish? What do, what do the hearts need to hear? Here's the first thing is this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, or if there's something in your life that would hinder your testimony, if there's something that you're struggling with in your life right now, God is big enough to deliver you from it. Whatever that might be, whatever that situation might be, God is able to change your life. I'm going to ask you right now, I want you to think about this, because there's two people in this room that know everything about your life. You and God. 